chatting and collaborating before the meeting even starts, but if we could all start taking our seats and uh, get this show on the road. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Am I, in the way? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Okay, we're going to start. We're going to start with our roll call, and I stole it from Connie, so she can't find it, which is why she hasn't started already. But um, you're going to hear a lot of new names tonight, people. So pay attention. Eva Henry. Here. Bill Holland. Here. Elise Jones. Dennis Harward, Greg Stokes, Tim Mock, Tom Hayden, Here. Chrissy Fanganello, Anthony Graves, Here. Robin Kniech, Here. Roger Partridge, Here. Gail Watson, Connie McLean, <coughs> Don Rozier, Present. Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Jim Peters, Here. David Spellman, Suzanne Jones, Here. and Justin. Lynn Baca, Cynthia Martinez, George Teal, Paul Donahue, Kathy Noon, Doris Trular, Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Here. Gail Christie, Richard Champion, Here. Rick Teeter, uh, Jim Benson, Here. Debbie Nasta, Joe Baker, Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Joe Jefferson, Here. Dan Woog, Mark Gruber, Joyce Thomas, Here. George Heath, Samantha Meering, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Henry Ergot, Lynette Kelsey, Paula Bovo, Doris Ragoni, Sersha Karras Graves, Here. Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Here. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Cernanek, Present. Jackie Malay. Here. Joan Peck. Here. Ashley Stolzman. Here. John O'Brien. Connie Sullivan. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Sean Forey. Chris Larson. Joe Gearlock. Kyle Mullica. Here. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Jordan Sowers. Jo I'm sorry. John Dyack. Josh Rivero. Gary Howard. Lando De Laguna. Rita Dozel. Here. Val Vigil. Here. Herb Atchison. Here. Joyce J. Here. Gary Sanford. Here. Deborah Perkins Smith. Here. Bill Van Meter. Here. We do have a quorum. Great. So I want to welcome some of the new folks that are joining us at the table for the first time. So um, Jim Peters from Bennett. Jim, will you just wave so everyone can or stand up so everyone can see who you are? Uh, welcome. Kyle Malika from North Glen. Kyle, thanks. Joan Peck from Longmont. Joan, welcome. And TJ Gordon. I know TJ's been here before, but this is first time at the big kids' table, right? Okay. Um, we have a couple mayors I'd like to congratulate that are, are um, may, may have been here before, but they weren't here in the capacity as a mayor for their community. So um, Joe Jefferson from Englewood, congratulations. <laughs> mayor Jefferson, Suzanne Jones from Boulder. Mayor Jones, well, uh, congratulations. And then Kyle, you get to stand up again so no one can forget you. So Kyle is the new mayor from, um, from no. North you're not, not oh, Kyle, I'm sorry. My, my notes are wrong. My notes are wrong. You, you've just received a promotion, and I apologize to your mayor. <laughs> I know, right? I hate it when that happens. Uh, so anyway, welcome. And we do have a couple goodbyes. I'm going to save those to the end because um, I don't like saying goodbye. Yes. There, there's one other person that's the mayor. It's Daniel Dick from Federal Heights. Oh, yeah. oh. welcome. Soon to be mayor. And your new mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Did I forget anyone? Okay. Thanks. With that, we're going to move on to, uh, I would look for a motion to approve our agenda. 
All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Abstained. We have an agenda. Um, we're going to start with a report of the chair. I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight about the structure and governance group that has been meeting for the last, has it been a year and a half? It seems like it. Uh, looking at ways <laughs> that we can become a more efficient organization. Um, a little heads up, we are looking at changing the um, MVIC meeting to a, a work session. That's a proposal that will be brought forth to the board. It would be um, a mandatory meeting in the sense that this is a mandatory meeting. It will lay the framework and groundwork to prepare us to have better discussions, um, more efficient discussions at the board table. Things will be vetted there. We'll give staff direction. Um, I think the intent is to not let things come to the board until we kind of have a good sense of um, unanimity or, or at least a majority opinion on where we want it to go and we will not re-debate issues from the MVIC meeting to the board meeting. That is obviously the goal. This body will decide before any change like that would be made. I do see eye rolling and I realize it's an aspirational goal, but um, I think if we don't set the standard and we don't hold ourselves to the standard, the number one complaint I, I do hear from this table is we're re repeating discussions and debates over and over again. And at least this is an opportunity to try and it, prevent it or minimize it. So. The, the group is meeting with, in addition to looking at that, we're also looking at the role of the admin committee and we're looking at a, a continuing review of the voting process at Dr. Cog. As we all know right now, it's one jurisdiction, one vote, regardless of anything else. Um, some of the other uh, ideas being explored are um, voting based on uh, payment of dues, which is a practice that has existed here. It's a weighted vote based on the for every $100 we, you spend in dues, you get one vote. Um, that, that has, practice exists, it has never been employed as far as I know, but it is something that is available to us today. We're also looking at um, population-based dues and, um, and then, you know, obviously continuing uh, on with what we're doing today. So these are all things happening in the governance group. Uh, we will be coming back to this body before any decisions uh, with, with a recommendation and then this body will actually make the decision. Uh, I want to announce the solicitation of nom nominations for the John V. Christensen Memorial Award. It's in attachment A in your packet. It, it is a, an award that really recognizes regionalism and collaboration uh, work um, at this table and really far beyond. If you look at the names of the past recipients, uh, these are very distinguished members of the community. Um, please review the application process and, and, and share it with your staff and um, uh, submit who you think might be a qualified eligible candidate. Um, we're also initiating the solicitation of nominations for the Metro Vision Awards. Those are in attachment B. Those um, acknowledge projects in the, in the region that have furthered our Metro Vision goals. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to comment on is we, are, we will be selecting a nominating committee this evening. Uh, the nominating committee will be responsible for presenting a slate of candidates with the exception of the chair, which I'm happy to say will be Ms. Uh, Elise Jones, County Commissioner Elise Jones. Um, but the other board uh, officer positions will be um, up for uh, the nominating committee to make selections. The nominating committee ideally is comprised of a mix of this body, large and small communities, cities and counties that represent the geography of this region. Uh, earlier this evening in the admin committee, two, uh, two candidates were selected, Ashley Stoltzman from Louisville and Robin Kanish from the city and county of Denver are the admin committee's representatives on the um, on the nominating committee. This body will be selecting two uh, individuals to serve as well. And then once I review those selections, uh, the chair makes the final two appointments and I will let you know. What I will be trying to do is round out the nominating committee so it is representative of this body. So um, we'll be doing that later tonight. So with that, that's all I've got. I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer for a report of the chair. Um, well, first I'd like to... Executive director. I'm the chair. <laughs> You're the mayor. Everyone's getting a promotion tonight. <laughs> uh, I wanted to call your attention to uh, some of the handouts at the table. There are a lot of new folks at the table this evening, um, and there is a new membership list there in front of you. Hopefully, we've reflected all the changes that 
um, uh, that have happened so far. Uh, if, if you see anything that's incorrect on that list, please let me know and we'll get that taken care of right away. Um, I want to remind you that the December board meeting, this meeting, uh, for December has been changed as far as the time goes. We'll be meeting at 4 p.m. instead of 6.30. That's so that once this meeting has concluded, we can all um, uh, join staff upstairs on the seventh floor. There are nearly 100 employees working for Dr. Cog, and they are all anxious to show you what they do. Um, we had a great open house last year in December. Uh, we played games, uh, we uh, saw a lot of um, maps and diagrams and charts and tried to make uh, learning about Dr. Cog more fun but also uh, a social opportunity for the board and, and a networking opportunity as well. So please mark your calendar. The board meeting is on December 16th at 4 p.m. There is no administrative committee meeting prior to that. And at 6, we'll all go upstairs, enjoy some uh, light refreshments, and uh, learn a little bit more about what Dr. Cog does. Um, the, another uh, document at your table is this one. Uh, this is a um, kind of a fact-finding mission for Dr. Cog. Uh, we have been contacted by um, um, the Urban Sustainability Accelerator pro uh, Program with Portland State University in Oregon. And each year, uh, the university puts together a cohort of entities around the nation to uh, solve a common problem. Uh, in the spring of 2016, they are going to be looking at transportation in, uh, investment decision making. Uh, they contacted us to see if this was something we would be interested in. And since we just got through a tip cycle, since we are, um, for those who are new, a transportation investment program cycle where we actually selected projects to be funded with Dr. Cog's uh, transportation uh, funding. Uh, and we have a, a number of member jurisdiction staff <laughs> um, looking at what future boards might want to consider the next time we have to do project selection. It seemed like a good opportunity to at least give this a look. So December 2nd and 3rd, uh, Robert Liberty, who runs this program for uh, the university, will be here to talk with board members, staff, uh, individuals who are on Dr. Cog's Technical Advisory Committee, and others about um, how we do transportation decision make, uh, finance decision making now, how we can change that, and this will be an opportunity for uh, us to decide if this is something we want to participate in with three or four other MPOs next year, and this will also be an opportunity for Mr. Liberty to decide whether or not they think that we're a good fit for the program. So. Um, if uh, you, you have the, uh, the dates and times there in front of you, you'll be getting an email tomorrow that has a link in it that you can actually go and register for the time that uh, best uh, fits you. If you would register, you don't absolutely have to, but it would be very helpful so that um, um, Mr. Liberty can kind of plan his schedule uh, accordingly. So really important. Hope that you can join us. And the last thing, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what Jackie said about um, the uh, Metrovision Awards and the John V. Christian Memorial Award uh, that will be uh, given out in April at our annual award dinner. Uh, we are really excited because we're going to do this at the New Weston Hotel at DIA. Um, we're talking with uh, RTD to see about maybe some uh, train passes. Uh, we don't know how that's going to go quite yet, but we are talking. Um, but we're very excited uh, to get this venue. We will be one of the first um, uh, groups that get into the hotel for this type of event. So um, this is something you don't want to miss. So again, as Jackie said, look over the, um, uh, the award information in, your, uh, in attachments A and B tonight and think about what your community is doing or people that you know uh, uh, that would be um, a good candidate uh, for the John V. Christensen Award. Uh, just a couple more things um, not related to any, any uh, documents on your table. Um, let's see. I know that there were a couple of things I wanted to tell you about. Um, 
I mentioned at the meeting last month that Dr. Cog has subscribed to something called Grant Finder. This is um, uh, some software that uh, allows you to go in and, and search through about 4,000 federal, state, corporate, and foundation grants uh, to help you find money to do programs that you may need in your community. Uh, this is a no-cost co pro uh, program to Dr. Cog board members. Um, I am guessing that we have enough seats uh, that uh, every jurisdiction that wants to participate can. We have nine jurisdictions currently who have signed up and said they want access to this. If you do as well, please just let Connie or I know and we'll get you in touch with the right staff here, Dr. Cog, to be sure that um, you get signed up for that. It's a great opportunity uh, if you're uh, looking for uh, some additional funding to do programs. Um, we also uh, received a $75,000 uh, grant from the uh, Department of Local Affairs. This is to implement uh, uh, or, or acquaint uh, our smaller jurisdictions with the Boomer Bond. Um, this, the money has to go to the small jurisdictions. That's the, the, the DOLA rules. So all of those uh, jurisdictions who are of population of 10,000 or less can qualify for this program. So uh, we'll be getting this underway soon, but this is to, to have dedicated staff working with small communities on uh, uh, putting the boomer bond in place um, to help um, your, uh, the smaller communities become more uh, age friendly. Mm. And I think I'll, I'll leave the other. I, there is some new news uh, on the Older Americans Act and some, um, some work that uh, Dr. Cog's staff and our federal lobbyist, Mickey Farrell, uh, have been working on, but he's going to give a report later in the program, so I'll ask him to talk about the letter uh, that uh, is circulating uh, uh, amongst the Colorado delegation when he gets up uh, later on this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we're moving on to the public comment portion of our agenda. Up to 45 minutes is allocated this time for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be al allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after public comment. Any takers? Takes me longer to read that than I actually, <laughs> so, okay, I don't see anyone, so we're going to move on to our consent ag agenda. I'll look for a motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay, moving on to the action agenda. Item number nine, discussion of a resolution approving the 2016 Dr. Cog budget. Jenny Doc will be leading that discussion for the Dr. Cog staff. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to uh, check out the link in your board packets, which actually takes you to the budget. And as you may recall, our executive director proposed and the board approved us synchronizing this process, the annual budget, with the annual strategic plan, formerly known as the work plan, back in July. So as a result, in August, staff presented a draft of the strategic initiatives plan along with their associated costs. And then in September, uh, staff presented operational objectives, including some different opportunities for innovation. And that happened in September. And tonight we round out this process by presenting to you the comprehensive package, which is the 2016 budget and uh, strategic initiative plan. So I'll draw your attention to a couple of highlights in, in the budget this year. First of all, the budget does include an overall decrease in federal funding by approximately 10%. There is a 26% increase in state funding, and in-kind revenues are remaining flat. UPWP and the AAA remain a bulk of Dr. Cog's funding and associated costs at approximately 62%. And Way to Go rounds out the top three, coming in at about 17% of our overall funding. In addition to the highlights, there is a noteworthy uh, variance in this year's budget that's reflected in the member due uh, line item. 
And so this year, staff is recommending that we bring dues current. Some of you may recall that during the 2010 budget cycle, the board approved retaining dues at 2009 levels, and that was primarily due to the economic downturn felt throughout the region. And now considering the steady improvement of the region's overall economy, staff has constructed the 2016 budget with membership dues at current assessment and population values. And uh, the Structure and Governance Group did meet on this a couple of times, and they did approve the dues calculation method in October. The um, Administrative Committee then uh, approved the, the recommendation of the 2016 budget, including the member dues at current population and assessment valuations. So as such, now staff is presenting to you the overall comprehensive package, which is the strategic initiative plan and annual budget for your <coughs> review and approval this evening. And I'm available for any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none, uh, Herb, Mayor Atchison. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Opposed? Abstained? We have a budget. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Attach <laughs> That's right. Uh, attachment E in our packets, uh, item number 10, discussion and direction to staff on the Denver Region Mobility and Accessibility Council due diligence. Jennifer. Actually, I'm going to defer to uh, Jacob Rieger. <laughs> Madam Chair, Executive Director, thank you very much. Uh, Jacob Rieger, Transportation Planning Coordinator at Dr. Cog. So this is a procedural item requesting authorization to conduct due diligence to explore folding Dr. Mack, which is the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, into Dr. Cog. Dr. Cog helped create Dr. Mack back in 2005 and has been a major funder and stakeholder since that time. We work with them in many ways, uh, particularly closely through our area agency on aging and through our MPO of our regional transportation planning activities. Dr. Mack, in one sentence, focuses on information sharing, education, and coordination to improve transportation mobility and options for older adults, individuals with disabilities, those with low incomes, veterans, and others. Though both, though both organizations coordinate closely, there is duplication, both administrative and programmatic. This exploration is about whether folding Dr. Mack into Dr. Cog can best help people who need transportation to maintain their independence. It is a critical issue in our region for our rapidly aging population and for those with disabilities, uh, low income, veterans, and others. It is a complicated issue. It's difficult. It's expensive and it involves multiple stakeholders, but it's very worthwhile. Reducing duplication, stretching limited dollars, and breaking down silos are absolutely critical to address this issue. Like any union, there are potential administrative cost savings, things like office space and equipment. The potential functional benefit is in working towards more and better service for those who need it by using taxpayer dollars most efficiently, leveraging funding sources, reducing duplication, and other strategies that only a merger would allow. For these reasons and more, the Dr. Mack Board recently requested Dr. Cog to explore the merits of folding Dr. Mack into Dr. Cog to see whether bringing both organizations together will help us do more than we can do separately. To be clear, staff is not presuming a particular outcome. Rather, we believe there's merit in conducting formal due diligence to investigate the financial, legal, and organizational feasibility of Dr. Mack folding into Dr. Cog. So to conclude, the motion before you is to proceed with due diligence to explore the possibility of Dr. Mack becoming part of Dr. Cog. We intend to come back to you soon with the results of that due diligence investigation and next steps. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mayor Chrisman. Is Dr. Mack contributing any cost to the um, due diligence uh, process? They are not. Commissioner Partridge. Thank you, Jacob. Jacob, could you be a little bit elaborate on uh, what you mean as due diligence? What would, that, what would the what would the makeup look? Would it be additional staff, additional funds, and uh, what kind of requirements and in the advantages? 
Well, all of those and more. Yeah, absolutely looking at sort of that staff structure, uh, working with our auditors, looking at finances, contracts. Um, I'd maybe defer to Roxy to uh, amplify. Yes, actually, Jacob um, hit it right on the head there. We are working with our auditor as well as our legal counsel, and we'll do a little bit deeper dive if you approve that tonight. We've got checklists to go over, like you mentioned, contracts to see what the contract obligations are, rent, things such as that. So we've got a long laundry list of things to go through. I have Council Member, member Shakti and then Mayor Jones. I just like a general sense of how big an organization is Dr. Mack. So we have Dr. Mack's executive director here tonight, Brian Allen, and I'd ask Brian to come up and, and talk about Dr. Mack. Hi. Let me pick this up a little bit. There we go. Good evening, everybody. Thank you again for allowing us to be on the agenda. Um, Dr. Mack was a nonprofit that was started about 10 years ago. Um, we have two staff, so we're not a, a large organization. Um, so uh, we don't think that would be a major issue. Um, the majority of our funding right now comes through uh, pass-through dollars from FTA, um, particularly in the 5310 section, which focuses on uh, older Americans and those that are disabled. Uh, that's typically where we get the majority of our funding. Uh, we've already been contracted with CDOT through the 2017 budget year. So Dr. Mack does have funds to bring to the table in order to help um, with this potential merger in terms of if it, if it was able to occur. Um, it's not like we're coming with nothing in hand. So we do have uh, some, some financial grants we've already secured. Um, like I said, we are a small organization. We're two people. Right now we work under uh, a current fiscal agent, the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center, which serves as basically a nonprofit incubator uh, in the Denver area. So Dr. Mack is essentially a project that gains our 501c3 status through our affiliation with CNDC. Mayor Jones. I just have, a, I think, an easy question. RTD does some of these types of, um, addresses some of these issues. I'm curious, are they a part of this conversation at all, or um, don't they also address mobility issues for this population? They do, and Dr. Mack does host a transit and accessibility task force that is made up of RTD staff, um, as well as citizen riders and advocates. Um, so we, we are all also partners at the table. Um, Bill Van Meter is pretty familiar with Dr. Mack. Um, we're, I think Dr. Mack, Dr. Cog, and RTD are very strong partners that are doing things together, but we felt that this might be a little bit more beneficial if we could kind of join forces with Dr. Cog. So well, you can go ahead and say it. You like us better. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will, I'll abstain from that. <laughs> Ms. Perkins-Smith. Uh, could you um, share with us who's on your board? Sure. Dr. Mack right now has a seven-member voting board and two ex officio seats that do not have voting members. Uh, our voting members are made up of um, organizations from around the Denver metro area. Um, we have Hank Braxma, who is the transportation director at Seniors Resource Center. Um, Sylvia Labrucherie, who is a consultant that's worked with CDOT. It's been a strong advocate in the terms of mobility management. Um, <clears throat> Audrey Krebs is with the Colorado Department of Human Services, also serves on our board. Roberto Ray, who represents AARP. Um, let's see, I'm, gonna go through, I'm trying to go through the list in my head here. There we go, thank you. Uh, An Andrea Wilson is the Assistant Executive Director with CASTA. Uh, Brent Belisle is a citizen advocate who is also a travel trainer that works with VIA Mobility Services out of Boulder. Um, Andrea Suhaka is also a citizen um, member as well who serves as the Chair of Transportation Solutions Arapahoe County, which is the local um, coordinating council for Arapahoe County. Uh, our two ex officio seats uh, belong, one belongs to Dr. Cog, which Matthew Helfant um, is here this evening. And our second ex officio seat belongs to Sharon Terranova, who is a senior transit and rail planner with CDOT. So we feel like we're pretty well connected with the major partners at the table. Yeah. So if, if I could just make a comment. Um, we think there's a lot of expertise in that board. And so going forward, when you look at that, we would hope that we would not lose that expertise is one thing. And the other thing is um, CDOT would certainly be interested in being part of any sort of evaluation as one of the founding members and obviously having an interest. Both noted. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mayor Atchison. Thank you, Jade. 
we had talked about this a little bit at, at the admin committee. Can you give us, uh, for the whole board, give us a rough idea of the timeline that you're looking at uh, and when this might be started and when it might be finished before you would bring it back to the full board for a recommendation? Sure, maybe I'll start and then, and then ask uh, Executive Director to amplify. Um, short answer is that we want to do this on a pretty fast track schedule. We do want to do the due diligence and we want to you know, work through that checklist. Uh, that Roxy mentioned, but we also want to do this in a pretty efficient way and come back, you know, really within the next couple months, uh, probably at the latest, um, we, you know, with some clarity of direction of, you know, where do the facts lead us in due diligence and what does that tell us about what next steps are. Okay. Any other questions? I do have a question. So will the feasibility study then give us kind of a scope of, I know you talked about the legal staff and, bu and budget implications, but will it give us a scope of services that will be provided should the organizations join together so this body can understand the full breadth of what would be taken on? Right, absolutely. I mean, okay. the big value here is, you know, is there a benefit to the region in combining forces. Can we do the things that we each do separately better together? So obviously a big piece of this once we get past the you know, major issues of finances and contracts and those sorts of things is you know, what is the benefit to the people that we're trying to serve with transportation? What can we do together by merging to make things better for folks? You know, more service, better service, later service. You know, both organizations, for example, um, our area, area agency on aging uh, and Dr. Mack have information assistance centers where folks can call in uh, and get, you know, get direction, get uh, advice of, you know, transportation options and, and other, um, you know, other services. You know, can we look at combining those and actually be more efficient uh, in that work? So all of those things are on the table, absolutely. And I'm assuming then that since you have that information service, is it something that you're currently contracting out if there's only two employees? So there no. Be, you're do, oh, so it's not 24-hour service then? It's a, <laughs> it, it is not. Dr. Mack, one, we put out, if you guys have seen, it's called the Getting There Guide. So it's our, our regional resource directory of all the transportation options um, in the, in the nine-county metro area that, that Dr. Mack serves. That's our, our public outreach piece that we print. Uh, typically on a yearly basis, and to date we've given out over 100,000 copies of that across the region. Um, we also operate a transit and assistance call center, which is staffed by one person. So, you know, we, we don't contract anything out in terms of, um, of what we do, um, and that staff person handles personal one-on-one -on -one consultations with uh, transit resources to get people narrowed down to some of those things that uh, will benefit them and not necessarily say, here's a list of 15 resources, good luck in finding one of them. You know, we ask those questions to help pare those things down to really lead them. Um, we also have an option to direct transfer to different organizations around the metro region to give them help directly uh, instead of them making another, another call to do that. Um, and one more thing I'd like to add is Dr. Mack um, is underway with a huge project in the metro area, which is a technology piece that will allow transit providers uh, and hopefully human service agencies alike to post and pull trips down through an internet web portal to better facilitate capacity usage across the region. So it's a huge project that we were awarded through a Veterans Transportation and Community Living Initiative grant. Um, it not only has regional significance, but national significance. Um, and we're very excited to have that project finally underway after, I think, three years. So this happened prior to me coming on board with Dr. Mack as the executive director. Um, but we've been able to really push that through to start that project. And that will benefit probably everybody's community here in this room today. Thank you very much. Sure. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick note that uh, we should investigate the governance and structure implications. Clearly with the governance committee that's working right now, thinking about the future structure and how all of our special committees fall into a more efficient structure. Since this has its own governance structure, if we were to pursue it, we need to think a little bit about how that affects current committee work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? S seeing none, I will look for a motion. What, uh, we do have to be a little bit more explicit. <laughs> Council member. Are we giving me a raise or are we actually? <laughs> <laughs> Motion to direct staff to proceed with the due diligence for the potential merger of Dr. Mack as part of Dr. Cog. Okay, we've got a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? We have a motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll get to Thank work. You. Thank you. All right, now we are moving on to selecting two members to the nominating committee. It's uh, action 
agenda item number 11. Attachment F in the packet gives you a little more detail. I um, will open the floor for, um, you can self-nominate or nominate someone uh, that you've, uh, you know, agreed to, to serve. And I will um, let you know that Mayor Ron Rakowski has expressed interest in serving on the nominating committee, and, and he is unable to be here this evening, so I will be um, nominating him, throwing that out. Mr. B Mr. Benson? Nominate uh, Commissioner Partridge of Douglas County. Okay. Uh, uh, Council Member Roth? Uh, yeah, George Teal couldn't be here this evening, but he expressed an interest as well. Commissioner Partridge. Nominate Don Rozier from Jefferson County. Councilmember Graves. I nominate myself. Uh, well, okay, sir. So, so, <laughs> I was going to nominate her, but she did it. Okay, before. forget you, Councilmember Pfeiffer. Yes. Yes. But, no, he nominated Sarsa. Is there anyone? Uh, I will nominate myself from the smallest community here. <laughs> Diversity at work. I like it. Okay. Is there anyone else? Okay. Here, yeah, here come the ballots. You are, please write down two names on the same sheet of paper. And um, to review, once again, uh, yeah, is there, is there any way we can put this on the board so people can see the names? Or no? Is that going to take a little too long? Uh, Okay, again. I'm going to read the names. Don Rogier and Don. Since we do have some new folks here, um, we probably should elaborate. Don is a Don. Why don't you just introduce yourself to the new members? <laughs> Good evening, Don Rogier, Jefferson County Commissioner, and have been on the Dr. Cog board now, going on five years, and served on many different committees. Thank you, Commissioner Partridge. Since you're right there, we'll. Good. Thank you. Uh, I've been on the Dr. Cog board for the last two years certainly believe that we are heading in the right direction and uh, certainly feel that there's been much collaboration in the last couple of years. We really appreciate all the involvement. Uh, I sit on many other metro and actually statewide boards as they'll have a, a good appreciation and understanding of uh, who will be the potential applicants and who will actually serve all of us for a good regional approach. And, and I don't know if you said it, Douglas County Commissioner. Um, and now, Sersha. Uh, uh, Sersha, I'll learn it eventually. It's a tongue twister with one word, and I apologize. Okay, I'm a member, um, oh, right. <laughs> I'm a council member for Golden. Have been on Dr. Cog two years. I'm serving on the Structure and Governance Committee. Um, Basically, I'm interested to represent uh, small communities and uh, in this nominating process, I think it's a really important voice um, to be uh, included. Thank you. Uh, Colleen Whitlow. Most northern. I'm Colleen Whitlow. I'm from the smallest northern town. Um, east of Longmont, I represent um, about 4,000 citizens there, um, which is not really small, but to me it's small. Um, it's a wonderful community. Flo just came and talked to us um, last, uh, last week and had a really good, um, good uh, rapport with her on everything that Dr. Cog brings to um, little towns. So it was really interesting for Flo to come. And thank you, Flo, again, for coming and having a couple hours with our our town staff and our town board. But anyway, I wanted to um, put my name in the hat. Um, I've been on the Dr. Uh, Cog board for about a year and a half, so I have a, a, a in the ad hoc committee for uh, the, the nine year one. So anyway. Thank you. And Mead. Yes. Town of Mead. Yes. Um, Bob, could you speak for George since he isn't here? I don't know how long he's been on the board, but uh, Council Member Teal is Council member for the town of Castle Rock, um, and I think he's been on the board about a year, year and a half. And and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make council member <laughs> Gordon speak for Mayor Ron Rakowski, um, and and maybe uh, Mayor Chrisman can add some of his Dr. Cog experience because uh, TJ hasn't been around the Dr. Cog group for that long, so. <laughs> Speak with the mayor today and he said, 
sorry about that. Uh, I did speak with Mayor Rakowski today, and he expressed that he has a strong interest to be on the nominating committee. Um, I do not know his Dr. Cog experience, but he has uh, 45 minutes worth of experience and other things, government related, volunteer related. I, I believe many of you know him on this board. Um, and I, all I would say is he, he would appreciate the, the nomination. Okay, I think we're good. So does everybody have a chance to vote? And if you have, please uh, pass them forward. And uh, Connie is going to be our our uh, official tabulator of the results. Um, while that is going on, I'm going to invite Mickey Farrell to move on down to the microphone. Mickey is our federal lobbyist. He is going to be, we're on our informational briefings now, item number 12. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the transportation reauthorization bill, and I also think he's going to speak to us a little bit on the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. Good evening. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me okay. Uh, normally when I come up here I get to talk about things that Congress has not done. Um, so this will be a little bit of a change. We get to talk about things that Congress actually has done and uh, where we sort of are uh, at this present moment in time when it comes to the uh, surface transportation reauthorization bill and then uh, kind of a path forward on that. So I'm going to start out with three different numbers. Um, the first is it has been 15 months, believe it or not, since the last surface transportation bill has expired, and, and we may all remember that. That was MAP 21. That was a two-year uh, surface transportation bill, but believe it or not, it has already been expired for 15 months, and uh, we are on our fourth extension of that as we currently sit. Uh, we are currently on a two-week extension and likely probably going to get another one of those two-week extensions. Uh, after next week uh, in hopes that they can pass a longer term bill and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. This is the more staggering number and this is the new era of transportation. Um, since MAP 21 has expired, the general fund of the Treasury of the United States government has transferred into the highway and transit trust funds almost 19 billion dollars, mm. meaning that the gas tax does not even come close to funding transportation anymore. And we are in a new era of transportation because of that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there are um, significant implications to that, uh, some of which are easily understood and some of which are not so easily understood, but we are definitely in a new era when it comes to uh, transportation funding and likely will be for uh, as we go forward. So, um, We'll start with the Senate bill because the Senate was first to act, which is kind of on its head normally. Normally the, the Senate is the slower one uh, to take up bills. But believe it or not, the Senate was the first to act and they passed uh, a bill called the DRIVE Act back in uh, late July. Uh, and DRIVE stands for, for those who are keeping score at home, um, developing a reliable and innovative vision for the economy. <laughs> Sometimes you just make it work, right? Uh, so uh, there's some uh, interesting nuances about both the House bill and the Senate bill that we'll talk about. MAP 21 is overall the policy. It was a generational bill, what we've referred to in Congress. It was a generational bill, meaning that it has outlined for the foreseeable future the overall structure of what the transportation programs are going to be. These bills, the House and the Senate, are tweaking that overall kind of generational bill, the, the previous bill, MAP 21. So when we're talking about the context of the changes that, that we're looking for are really kind of under that umbrella bill, which was um, MAP 21. There were some interesting things that in particular were, are, um, have, a, have a meaning for uh, Colorado that were um, sort of changes in, in uh, MAP 21 that Colorado, w w from a Colorado perspective, we wanted to see changed. Um, but before I get into some of those specifics, I'm going to talk about the funding framework for the Senate bill and then we'll compare it with the House bill in a second. Um, traditionally, each year there's an inflationary additional amount that goes into transportation. The House bill did not carry that, but the Senate bill did. 
So really roughly what we're talking about overall on the highway side is about $540 million a year that would come back to Colorado. And by the end of that, in fiscal year 2021, in the Senate side, we'd have about $624 million. That's a 3% inflationary index in the life of the Senate bill, which is a pretty significant step forward. Uh, roughly about $100 million more a year by 2021 than we are currently right now today. That's you know, a, a pretty significant step forward. A tool, a financial tool that the state of Colorado has started to use a lot more in funding projects as we go forward is the TIFIA program, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the TIFIA program. Under the uh, MAP 21 bill, TIFIA went through an enormous expansion uh, to the tune of a $2 billion a year allocation and a $1.75 billion a year allocation, but every year whatever funds were not expended in those accounts were redistributed among the states. So it kind of went in there, whatever was used up, was used up for projects and then it was kind of formulated out. Congress realized that $2 billion is more than they can actually spend in any year, so they dramatically cut that funding level down. However, if that redistribution provision would have remained in there, it would have been challenging at best for some of our larger projects that are on the horizon like an I-70 East, but potential C-470 or any of the other larger projects in the future, TIFIA would have, it would have been challenging for Colorado to compete against potentially other large national projects. And so from a Colorado's perspective, our two senators really kind of latched onto this issue in the Senate bill and, and got a change that eliminated that redistribution to protect the account so that there would be enough money uh, in there to uh, hopefully Colorado is able to progress forward and be able to access those funds to deliver those larger projects. So that's a fairly significant change that both senators really worked uh, uh, diligently on to get that change put into the Senate bill. And it was, uh, <laughs> I, can I can still uh, remember, um, on a Sunday evening, a poor guy at TIFIA, I, I feel really bad for him. The uh, US DOT secretary, the two senators, and this poor guy from TIFIA all got on a conference call at 7 o'clock on a, on a Sunday evening and uh, hashed out this kind of deal in which they got the funding level and the redistribution provision uh, worked out together. So it was kind of a, a, a fairly good success for the state of Colorado in protecting our projects and, as we go forward. The Senate bill is uh, different from the House bill in that there, and one of the reasons why Colorado uh, and the nation will receive so much more money over the next six years if this bill were to be enacted in the Senate's version is that there is a funded freight program. So under the uh, MAP 21 bill, there was a freight program. Unfortunately, it was not funded. So now Congress has taken that next evolutionary step in that they actually provided funding for that. Uh, a good thing under the Senate bill is that uh, Senator Gardner was able to secure an amendment um, through the committee process that changed the formula to recognize rapidly growing states and that helped direct more money inside of that formula to Colorado through the freight program. So that was a, a pretty good change for Colorado um, on that side of it. The House does not carry that and we'll talk a little bit about what they do on the freight side um, and how it's different from the Senate side. One of the changes that we're really monitoring in the Senate bill as we head into conferences, under the STP program, there was a 15% off the top for uh, off-system bridges. That's a fairly significant departure from the history of the uh, federal transportation program, meaning it's leaving the, the interstate NHS system and branching out more broadly into sort of an off-system uh, program. The House did not carry that same provision, so it's one of those interesting items to see when they're deciding on how much money there is, if that provision will carry through or not, but it's something definitely we're watching. Um, on the transit side, there were um, a couple of significant victories for Colorado when it came to um, bus and bus facilities in particular. Um, so the 5309 program, the bus and bus facilities program, that was a program in safety loo that was ended in MAP 21, and it has been re-brought back into um, the Senate bill uh, on the Drive Act, which is, is great for our transit folks. It allows them to compete for funds to uh, do bus replacements, a discretionary grant program 
um, back from previous programs and also has a facilities component so you know bus barns and things like that it's a it's a great program and our transit folks Casta and others uh, really pushed hard to try to get that change in and, and um, the good news is that program was reestablished another significant uh, victory in the Senate bill was the redefinition of BRT uh, in safety Lou there was a definition for bus rapid transit that really kind of works on the Western model where we use BRT routes on our HOV HOT lanes um, which allows for a guaranteed travel time and that guaranteed travel time is really the most important aspect of kind of BRT it, under the um, map 21 bill the big states the fixed guideway states they really lobbied hard to have chain, uh, Congress change that definition of BRT to be fixed guideway meaning no other traffic could mix in and out um, and they were successful in doing that which really eliminated a lot of the way western states or newer states could access into BRT routes and we worked really hard to get that language changed to re-establish that BRT definition. We didn't quite get 100 percent, but I'd say we got 75 percent. Um, so corridors like US 36, which are going to be very successful guaranteed travel time corridors, and that's really what you're looking for is a guaranteed travel time. Um, it will allow us to develop corridors in the future that will have that guaranteed travel time component which will then allow us to access these funds potentially to develop those corridors. So that's a pretty significant victory. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, Senator Gardner and Senator Bennett teamed up again to change uh, the NHTSA section of the bill uh, to change the way they do granting programs to specifically look at vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication so executive director um, bat was here last week he talked a little bit about the road X program that CDOT is looking into it sort of fits into that model about NHTSA deploying vehicle to vehicle vehicle to infrastructure technology so that's the Senate bill um, it um, passed uh, in a unique way the Senate did not take amendments they took one they took one from the manager uh, so the floor debate in the Senate was really unusual in the world's most deliberative body there was no deliberation um, which really sort of um, changed the dynamic of how they can uh, consider the bill um, in the House side however there were more than 300 amendments that um, we went through together in a very painful process um, but we were able to, they were, the House was able to get through those, believe it or not, in uh, four legislative days. Uh, and the House bill, again, falls under that same umbrella from the previous bill. Um, and that both bills are, in theory, six-year bills. The Senate only passed three years worth of funding, sort of three years. In between the House and the Senate considering the bills, the House took up the, another budget bill, a budget compromise bill, and then they promptly took a lot of those pay-fors in the Senate bill and then used them up to pay for the budget bill. Uh, so that poses an interesting challenge. So where we stood as the House was taking up the bill was they had about two years of funding that the Senate actually paid for in a six-year bill. Um, the House recognized that and when they brought up their bill they had of those 300 amendments about half of them were transportation related what we'd call highway and transit related the other half were on everything but transportation um, there was on the import export bank it was on pay fors for the bill it was on a bunch of different items so what the house did instead of the senate is that the house said we can't pay for that increased funding every year so we're just going to keep it pretty much flat so instead of starting out at $540 million like the Senate bill did in ramping up to $624 million, they took it down a step. They start at $524 and they end at $580. It's still progressing just at a much slower rate, um, which changed the way they could look at pay-fors and, and how much would be needed over, over that time. Um, they were able to um, change the TIFIA provision to be more like the Senate's version. Instead of 300 million, they got to 200 million, but the compromise was that they eliminated the redistribution provision. So again, it's kind of a win for Colorado. We're playing in that ballpark of 300 to 200 million, no redistribution. 
We think that's going to be good enough, hopefully at the Senate level, to protect Colorado projects. Um, the House bill did not have a freight program, and it did not obviously fund it. What they did is they created more of a competitive grant program that would be related to freight. We will see it's an idea, right? And the conference will ultimately resolve that to see if that's the way they go forward or if they go forward with the Senate provision. But that's going to come down to ultimately money, and we'll talk about that in, in one second. Um, Representative Polis got the only Colorado amendment on the floor uh, on the House bill, and that was to designate I-70 as a high-priority corridor. Uh, so there are certain roads in the United States that are designated as high priority. In Colorado, that's kind of I-25, it's I-76, it's the Ports to Plains corridor, which is 285, and then kind of comes in on I-70. This kind of connected the eastern side of the United States, believe it or not, to the western side. There was only one east-west road that connected the, the Midwest and East Coast to the West Coast. So if this provision were to be adopted, it would provide a secondary high-priority corridor. All it really means is that if there are granting programs, it's a consideration for grants. It used to be that they would fund high-priority corridors. They, don't, they haven't done that in a long time. But it is a, a place where if there's a tiger, it's a consideration for potentially a grant. Um, and then on the House side, we're able to do similar things to the Senate side when it came to transit. So the 5309 program was fixed, but in a different way that the big states aren't really going to like. And unfortunately, when you look at the conferee list, yikes, it's going to be tough to keep. Um, but basically what they did is they took the big seven states and they took the money away from them, so like New York's and some other places. They took money out of their formulas and put it back into the 5309. So we'll, we will see if that survives. Um, and then we're able to continue the BRT definition more similarly to the, the Senate side in the House. So that was a, a good step forward. Where we currently are right now is that both the House and the Senate have passed their bills. And we're in what's known as a conference committee. Uh, so meaning that they are trying to resolve the differences, and today was the very first day of the conference committee. And the good news is nobody killed the bill on the first day. Uh, so we still have a shot. Um, the Behind the scenes, it, this is going to be hard. Um, the funding gap is big. Um, but everybody's saying the right thing to get um, a bill. And so that's progress. You just start looking at the calendar. December 15th is the last day they're going to be there. And next week they're out for Thanksgiving. Uh, just look at the calendar and there's not a lot of room. Um, but at least today we have a shot. And that's the hope, is that we're, we're going to have a shot. Um, the budget numbers, uh, when I saw the CBO score last night that came out on the House bill, uh, I did a double take. The, the numbers are staggering of how much general fund money has to go in on a per year basis now. 50% of the transit program will now require general fund money. And highway folks, it's no better. It's almost 40%. It's a, it's a third and it'll ramp up to 40%. So on a per year basis, we're all going to learn a new term as we go forward. And it's called subject to appropriations. So every year, the Appropriations Committee has to pass that funding into the, into the transportation programs, meaning that the budget bill now comes in and in a more prominent way. The appropriations bills will now come in in a more prominent way. Uh, it's no longer a guarantee that when you have a, a dedicated revenue source and it goes into a trust fund, the appropriators and the budget committee could not touch it. But that, that era no longer exists. And so as we go forward, subject to appropriations is going to be a, a term you're going to hear a lot about and, what, and the instability that will go along with it as we go forward. Um, we will see. There, um, there are one or two vehicles left this year to move. We have to fund the government beyond December 15th. That's why everyone's looking at December 15th, right? So we haven't passed any appropriations bills. So that is a place in which a transportation bill could hook onto and go forward and get passed. Um, 
or believe it or not, this is the second really of the two bills that are, people are talking about as a bill that sort of, uh, look, I've done a good job of filibustering my time already. Um, of, <laughs> uh, of a way for a bill to go forward. There's some contentious issues out there and we don't need to rehash them, but we are hoping that this bill won't get caught up in some of those contentious issues and, and bring it down. Uh, so we will be doing a lot of work over the next few weeks to see if we can't get this bill out of a conference committee and then passed by both houses. So I guess my time is up. <laughs> You're cut up. But, but we do have time for questions. <laughs> Commissioner Holden. There was talk early on, and I don't know what, what happened to it, that, that there was going to be an effort to seek re um, uh, um, reconciliation of some of the overseas tax funds being used as a, as a uh, incentive to, uh, to at least give a kickstart to those existing and pending programs. Can you comment on that? So it was the leading source of additional revenue for a very long period of time. Um, in fact, it, believe it or not, it's still out there. Um, Speaker Ryan said yesterday he would like to still pass that, and he is looking at the transportation bill as a potential way of doing that. At this point, it would be problematic for transportation probably because it brings in more revenue than could be spent by transportation, and then other fights start to take place, other programs. What are you going to fund? Are you going to fund tax cuts? Are you gonna, what are you going to do? So it is still out there. Um, Speaker Ryan was the tax committee chairman, so he is going to hold a lot of power in what bills go for the remaining portion of the year, but it is definitely still one of those issues that are still out there being talked about. Um, Senator Bennett really was pushing this for a while on the Senate side. This is a non-starter in the Senate, um, much more a House provision than a Senate provision. Commissioner Partridge. Okay. Mickey, that was great. Now, in fact, I was uh, considering until the chair held up in one minute to have you s chair. repeat that, but anyway. <laughs> the chair did not hold up the one minute. The record shall note. The mayor did? No, yeah, I gave myself a promotion too. No, 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 no. Mickey, just a real quick question on the Winter Conference Committee, when it comes to all the amendments, do they take each bill as an individual bill or do they have to go through all the amendments for each bill so the the normal answer would be yes but the house did something very interesting <laughs> the house so the bill is actually an old bill that the senate amended and passed back to the house and this is going to get way inside dc but the house didn't actually pass the senate bill they passed an amendment to a bill of their original bill and then sent it to committee they didn't actually pass the it's just weird insight so they have a, a, a lot of different paths in the conference committee to be able to take different angles that they normally wouldn't be able to do. They would be normally very restrictive in what the conference committee could actually look at. They sort of broadened the door a little bit because they had so many other issues attached to the transportation bill that they needed to broaden the bill out a little bit, the conference committee's scope out a little bit. I'm sorry, that's, it's a good question. It's just a really complex question. Councilmember Benson. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm glad to hear that more money is going to be available for transportation, but, and you said that 60% of that money is coming from the general fund. Is there any movement to um, go with road usage charges or MBUF or uh, VMT, anything like that where transportation funding is directly related? to the people who are using the roads, like it has been with the gas tax. Right. Um, the gas tax still has a veto from the president, a formal veto. Um, the mileage-based user fee, um, the Senate bill carries a multi-state pilot program, um, which we have, from the Colorado perspective, have been advocating for, because until you can start to deploy that on a regional basis, multi-state, to figure out who's going to collect the tax, how they're going to collect the tax, how they're going to distribute it among the states. Washington, Oregon have been m kind of going back and forth with this a little bit because of the cross traffic, that kind of stuff. Yeah, Oregon's got a pilot program. Yeah. Right now, right? Uh, okay. Actually, so, I might address, I'm actually working on a committee that's looking at that in terms of western states so that we're ready. 
if it yeah if it does we get we feel like we need to get a pilot program put into place to demonstrate out the technology so that it could be a new path forward as a revenue source potentially right. um, to help fund transportation to get the user fee back into it instead of a general fund program. How long do you think that's going to take? I th it's at least one six year bill, if not two. There are, okay. I think the technology side's easier. It's the political, it's the political side, it's the privacy concerns, it's the extraneous issues that are going to take longer for representatives and senators to overcome to feel comfortable enough to say that they could pass that as a revenue source. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sinanix. Uh, Mickey, again, thanks. Uh, with this subject to appropriation, yes. um, is this going to be a continuation of uncertainty so that uh, any dollars that come I uh, have a discount because of length of time that they can actually be committed. Um, why, why in particular, uh, kind of. Um, I, one, I, I appreciate that definitive response. <laughs> <laughs> one of the unique things that transportation has is multi-year contract authority. And general fund revenues put at stake that multi-year contract authority. So one of the reasons why we care so much is because things like rescissions or let's say sequesters or other items that come along in theory can back cut contract authority and it becomes much more complex when you have that multi-year. So the, believe it or not, the Department of Defense does not have multi-year contract authority. So when they contract for an aircraft carrier, they pay, oops, sorry, they pay for the entire aircraft carrier in one shot. We don't do that. We are a reimbursement program. So that ex those extraneous issues when it comes to the budget are much more difficult to deal with when you have a multi-year contract authority bill like transportation. So in other words, uh, it sounds like subject to appropriation means that whatever dollars they're putting out are subject to uncertainty discount. And that's on a year-to-year -year basis. And that, yeah, and, and again, inside DC stuff, but you can pull back money from previous years. So subject to appropriations is a, is a bad place to be. How do we get that changed? I'm That's, sure we're working on it. It's why they created trust funds. Are there any additional questions, comments? Thanks, Mickey. It's clear as mud. Um, moving on to our committee reports, I am going to request the reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. I'm going to start with the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Elise Jones. So just a couple things. Um, the stack got an update on I-70 peak period shoulder lane. That will be opening for the winter season on the weekends. CDOT's running it, not a concessionaire. They're looking for more money so they can expand it further down I-70. And the commitment for tolled vehicles will be 45 miles per hour. They recognize it's not a permanent solution, but um, perhaps a way to raise revenues for a permanent solution. We got a visit from State Representative Terry Carver, who came and reported, in, uh, reported on her two transportation bills. One was to clarify that the stack actually is giving advice to the Transportation Commission as well as CDOT. I think it's a, a perennial issue that the stack feels like it's not uh, respected enough and needs to be heard more. That would help address that. The, the other one more important for us would be her bill to expand the number of Transportation Commission members from 11 to 15 and to only have one per each TPR so Dr. Cog would only have one Transportation Commission members. That's not a bill that we've taken a stance on, but historically we would have a problem with that based on our legislative policy. We, certain, we currently have four Transportation com member, Commission members representing our region. She at least recognized that the bill was a non-starter for Dr. Cog and that it needed to be amended to reflect VMT and population. And she alluded that she recognized it might become a study bill. So, and I certainly encouraged her to continue thinking in that direction. 
Uh, then we also um, got updates on federal the federal bill that, that Mickey just talked about and the same uh, CMAC alt fuels report that we got here as well. So there's a parallel universe happening between Stack and Dr. Cog right now. Thank you. Elise uh, Herb, Metro Mayor's Caucus. Yeah, I'm filling in on this for Kathy Noon, who's out of town. Uh, the information that Kathy sent me is that uh, the Metro Mayor's Caucus Home for the Holidays campaign uh, for the holiday letter to landlords, which will be distributed by Brothers Redevelopment and Area Housing Authorities in support of our Landlords Opening Doors campaign, offering funds to help increase the availability of units for the homeless. Uh, this is a piece that uh, the Metro Mayor's was doing a fundraising for uh, earlier this year. Uh, Note that there are a number of new mayors due to the elections. Uh, I think the number was somewhere around seven or nine uh, in the metro area. Uh, planning for the metro mayor's annual retreat is set for uh, January the 9th. And the legislative reception, I believe that's still a partnership between CCI and metro mayors. That is scheduled for December the 9th. And that is here at the dam. Yeah, the dam. Thank you, Herb. Okay. Don Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll tell you what the agenda was, but I'm going to have to defer to somebody who was actually in the meeting. Um, I got caught, all the county commissioners, well, Jefferson County commissioners, we got caught in a six-hour budget meeting. So we were unable to attend, but it, the, pri the, the focus of the meeting had to do with legislative priorities. And at that meeting, the Colorado County Clerks Association was in attendance, the Coroner's Association, Treasurer, Sheriff's Association, Assessors, Public Trustees, and the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Anybody else would like to add to that? Come on, Eva. Come on, Elise. Um, so uh, in terms of legislative priorities, we decided to emphasize reauthorization of the SEFD and um, reauthorization of the Affordable Housing Tax Credit. We're also going to stay tuned on the uh, Workforce Implementation Act and whether or not that requires special attention by front range commissioners. And we'll revisit also um, uh, our feelings about um, hospital provider fee fixes and other um, financial fixes that might provide more funding to counties for county admin and transportation. Thank you. Any, any other comments, Eva or Roger? Good? Okay. All right, we're telling on you, Roger. All right, uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla. So we didn't have a meeting, but I want to take this opportunity to um, recognize uh, Jefferson County Commissioners, Don Rozier in particular, uh, for hosting a caregiver uh, event in Jefferson County, recognizing the caregivers um, and their critical role that they play. If we didn't have caregivers, uh, we'd have to pick up those services, um, you know, with with uh, county services or with AAA services, and we couldn't do it without, we couldn't serve those people. And then also thanks to Anthony Graves, um, he set up yet another meeting um, to, for us to talk about uh, the Boomer Bond with Denver staff. It was very successful, and we're moving forward. They have adopted, they've decided to go to, through the Boomer Bond process as their age matters in their Age Matters program. And uh, so we're very excited about that. It was very successful. Had the city, uh, the, one of the top city planners there, and he had lots of questions afterwards. So that's, also, that's awesome. And uh, I just wanted to let you know we could use another board member on the Aging Advisory Committee. So anyone who's interested, you could give me a, a call or, or contact Connie, and we'll, we'll chat. Third Friday, we give you lunch. Thanks, Jayla. <laughs> Can alternate yes. serve? That's the best deal. Yes. <laughs> that is the yes. best deal in Dr. Cog. And I yes. believe alternates can serve. Yes, yes they alternates can. Alternates can serve. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, now we're moving on to the Regional Air Quality Council. I know Joyce wasn't able to attend that meeting, so I will stand in. Um, First of all, I, I actually think, as you guys know, this ozone issue is extremely important to the Denver region. And I would actually encourage you all to go on the RAC website and pull down the um, meeting materials from these meetings because they're extremely informative. And I think the more informed we are on this issue, the better decisions we will all be making. So there was an overview of the implementation of the Colorado's Clean Power Plan. Uh, we talked about the implementation implications and implementation timeline for the EPA's new 70 parts per billion ozone standard. Uh, there was an emissions inventory and reasonable further progress plan for the 2008 
ozone standard implementa state implementation plan because as we all know, we're in the process of being a non-attainment for the 2008 standard, so we've got to develop a state in implementation plan to try and meet that standard in the meantime, keeping in mind that we've got a further lowering of the standard that was just adopted um, this October. So um, again, the RAC website's very easily accessible. Please go on and it'll give you even more details. And I'll, I'll ask our executive director, who was also at the meeting, if there's anything else you want to add to that. And, and uh, Commissioner Jones, who evidently attends every single meeting uh, that Dr. Cog has. Everywhere. Um, okay, we, uh, Mayor Rakowski is not here for E-470, but I am told that Councilmember Gordon has a good authority, knows what, what happened. Uh, yes, Mayor Rakowski just wanted me to share with everyone here that the E-470 authority will be uh, appointing a new director in December. And that was all the information he had. Thank you. Um, Mr. Van Meter, a report on Fast Tracks? Last night, the RTD board approved two consultant services contracts in support of Fast Tracks for the 2016 calendar and fiscal year for RTD. They also took the significant action of naming the 61st and Pena station on the University of Colorado A-Line. It's named the 61st at Ampersand Pena station name. So I know everyone was waiting for that and I'm very excited for that determination. Board acted on that last night. Um, the day after we met last month, RTD did announce the opening date for the CU or University of Colorado A-Line between Denver Union Station and DIA. I assume most folks, in, if not everyone in here, has heard. But since I didn't report on it last month, I figured I'd better get that on record. April 22nd is the opening date for the CU A-Line. And in advance of that, January 3rd, is the opening date for the Flatiron Flyer, the US 36 bus rapid transit service. So January 3rd, Flatiron Flyer, US 36 BRT, and April 22nd, University of Colorado A-Line. That concludes my report. Thank you. Um, I know you're all waiting with bated breath about the nominating committee. Uh, to remind everyone, uh, Ashley Stoltzman, Robin Kanish from the admin committee. And I, once again, I am going to go with the established precedent here as the chair of going with the top four vote getters. Um, uh, we've got good geographic coverage. Um, uh, we have good county, city coverage. We do not have great um, medium community representation on this. I will let you know I have a concern about that, but looking at the list, there was nobody on the list who threw their name in the hat that really is from the medium-sized community. So the top four get vote getters in no particular order are Commissioner Roger Partridge, Mayor Ron Rakowski, Councilmember Colleen Whitlow, and uh, Councilmember Sersha Graves. So uh, th that is your nominating committee. Thank you all for agreeing to serve. I am going to ask and remind, excuse me, anyone who is interested in serving on the admin committee to get their nomination, a statement of interest, excuse me, into Connie by Friday. If you're interested in serving as an executive officer, you need to get your statement of interest uh, form into Connie as well by Friday. Uh, any questions? Uh, yes. Not Council Member Roth. Other matters? Uh, we, we're almost there. Thank you. Uh, we, I'm just going to make a note. Your informational items, uh, 14, 15, and 16, are attachments H, I, and J in the packet. Um, I think I know what, uh, Bob, Bob, please, you go, you, you go first, and then I actually have some other, other ma matters by members. So we're, I'm going to have Bob, and then I'll have Anthony, and then... Um, Go ahead, Bob. I just wanted to take the opportunity to recognize one of our own. Uh, Denver Business Journal this week, yesterday, uh, named the top 25 most powerful women as named by Colorado Women's Chamber of Commerce. And Council Member Robin Kanich was one of those 25. Yay. <laughs> Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair. First, thank you for your efficiency this night. You are racing through. I actually had something quickly under aging when Jayla was up but didn't get a chance to do it. I just wanted to recognize the work that we're doing here at Dr. Cog for the Ombudsman Program. Uh, last month I took time to go and tour a senior facility with them 
and they really are incredible advocates for people who are voiceless in our senior com community. And it doesn't really get much visibility around here. So I've, I've really been trying to kind of up my aging game here at Dr. Cog. And with that, as I've been doing my own homework, I wanted to come to the table tonight with a bit of a challenge. Sheila talked a little bit about uh, my assistance in helping to set up some of these briefs within, within Denver. I, I'm really determined, I've been talking to Councilman Kanish about this as well, about first making sure that every mayoral appointee for the city of Denver that runs every city agency is exposed to this information so that they can think about, as agency heads, what dials they can turn, which levers they can push to try to you know, advocate on behalf of seniors and their needs since one in four by 2030, right, is going to be over the age of 60. And then Councilman Kanish has talked about bringing something to committee, I believe, as well. So I just wanted to encourage uh, all of the members here around the table to, to think uh, specifically about what we can do by agency to, to, do, to have greater gains on behalf of our seniors. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, we have to do something I don't like doing at Dr. Cog now, is say goodbye to some long-serving members of our board. Um, Joyce Thomas is term limited and will not be rejoining us at the Dr. Cog table, but I want to say what an honor and privilege it has been to serve on this board with you and what a great addition you have made here and on the rack. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to say something as well if you, if you would care to. It's hard to realize that eight years is up already. And everybody asks me, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? Are you going to run for commissioner? Are you going to serve on the state senate? I go, you know, I just want a break right now. <laughs> <laughs> I keep get asking to do things to, to fill my time. And I go, you know, let's just wait. Till, talk to me in May or June. I do our, our also serve on the Pinnacle Charter School Board. I um, have been on that for about two and a half years and have an opportunity to be reappointed in June for another three-year term. Um, I'm doing more, trying to do more with my church. Um, I'm a member of DAR and they're asking me to serve more, to do more. So um, I have plenty of opportunities to stay busy. I, and I am a CPA and I, uh, tax season's coming. <laughs> yeah. How, how did you even fit us in? No. <laughs> Again, I, I, they will have the honor and privilege of serving with you. So I think, uh, you know, our loss will be their gain. So thank you for that. And let's give her a round of applause. I also am sad to say goodbye to Councilmember Jim Benson, who is not even looking at me. <laughs> Again, I too want to say thank you so much for your dedicated service. Uh, you are a stalwart member of this board. You, you are here and present and engaged and involved and thank you for your service here and on E470. So, um, and if you would like to say a few words. So, you know, after eight, eight and a half years, uh, I guess it's been eight and a half years, um, it's my conclusion that the uh, collegiality and intellect of this board is without equal I'm just glad to be a part of it for the past eight and a half years. People ask me what I'm going to be doing. I've got a lot of work to do. I mean, I'm not retired uh, yet. I don't know that I ever will be, but uh, I'll be able to fill my time with making money, I hope. <laughs> Best of luck with that endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Okay, I will remind you once again that our next meeting is December 16th. At the start time is at 4 p.m. I'm going to really encourage all of you to stick around afterwards to go to the open house upstairs. It is a tremendous opportunity to see the breadth of the work that is done by the Dr. Cog Agency. It is amazing. I think you will learn something. I think people who have even been on this board for multiple years have things that they will continue to learn from participation and invite your alternates to come and our, our board members that are leaving if you want one last chance to say goodbye come say goodbye to us again too um, with that I'm going to adjourn the meeting thank you all <laughs>